Alright, hey guys, welcome back. We are going to continue with Bridge to Der Terabithia by Catherine Patterson. Uh, we left off. We were having a discussion with Leslie, Jess, and Maybell were having a discussion uh, after church about what happens when you die. Jess and Maybell believe the Bible and that you'll, if you don't, you'll go to hell. God will damn you to hell. And Leslie doesn't believe that. She says she doesn't think God goes around damning people to hell. That's where we left off. So let's continue there. Chapter 9. The Evil Spell. On Easter Monday, the rain began again in earnest. It was as though the elements were conspiring to ruin their short week of freedom. Jess and Leslie sat cross-legged on the porch at the Burks, watching the wheels of the passing truck shoot sp huge sprays of muddy water to its rear. That ain't no 55 miles per hour, Jess muttered. Just then, something came out of the window of the cab. Leslie jumped to her feet. Litter bug, she screamed after the already disappeared tell already disappearing taillights. Jess stood up too. What do you want to do? What I wanted to do is go to Terabithia, she said, looking out mournfully at the pouring rain. Heck, let's go, he said. Okay, she said, suddenly brightening. Why not? She got her boots and raincoat and considered the umbrella. Do you think we could swing across holding the umbrella? He shook his head. Nah, we better stop by your house and get your boots and things, he shrugged. I don't have any that fit. I'll just go like this. I'll get you an old coat of, of bills, she started up. The stairs and Judy peered in the hallway. What are you kids doing? It was the same words that Jess Mothers might have used, but it didn't come out the same way. Judy's eyes were kind of, of fuzzed over as she spoke, and her voice sounded as though it was being broadcast from a mile away. We didn't mean to bother you, Judy. That's all right. I'm stuck right now. I might as well stop. Have you had any lunch? It's all right, Judy. We can get something ourselves. Judy's eyes focused slightly. You've got, to, you've got your boots on. Leslie looked down at her feet. Oh, yeah, she said, as though she were just noticing them herself. We thought we'd go out for a while. Is it raining again? Yeah. I used to like to walk in the rain, Judy smiled, the kind of smile Maybell did in her sleep. Well, if you two can manage. Sure. Is Bill back yet? No, he said he wouldn't be back until late. Not to worry. Fine, she said. Oh, she said suddenly, and her eyes popped wide open. Oh, she almost ran back to her room, and the plinkety-plink of the typewriter began at once. Leslie was, gr was grinning. She came unstuck. He wondered what it would, would be like to have a mother whose stories were inside her head instead of marching across the television screens all day. He followed Leslie up the hall to where she was pulling things out of a closet. She handed him a beige raincoat and a particularly round black woolly hat. No boots, her voice was coming out of the depths of the closet and was muffled by the line of overcoats. How, bear, how about a pair of clumps? A pair of what? She stuck her head out between the coats. Cleats. Cleats, she produced them. They looked like size 12. No, nah, I'd lose them in the mud. I'll just go barefoot. Hey, she said, emerging completely. Me too. The ground was cold. The icy mud sent little thrills of pain up their legs. So they ran splashing through the puddles and sloshing in, <clears throat> in the mud. P.T. bounded ahead, leaping fish-like from one brown sea to the next, then turning back to her the two of them forward, nipping at their heels and further splashing their already slopping jeans. When they got to the bank of the creek, they stood, it, they stopped. It was an awesome sight, like in the Ten Commandments on TV. When the water came rushing into dry path, Moses had made a, and swept all the Egyptians away. The long, dry bed of, creek, of the creek was roaring eight feet wide. It was a roaring eight feet wa foot wide sea. Sweeping before it great branches of trees, logs, and trash, swirling them about like so many Egyptian chariots. The hungry waters licking and sometimes leaping the banks, daring them to try to confine it. Wow, Leslie's voice was respectful. Yeah, Jess looked up at the rope. It was still twisted around the branch of the crabapple tree. His stomach felt cold. Maybe we ought to forget it today. Come on, Jess, we can make it. The hood of Leslie's raincoat had fallen back and her hair lay plastered to her forehead. She wiped her cheeks and her eyes with her hand and then untwisted the rope. She snapped the top of, the, of her coat with her left hand. Here, she said, stick P.T. in here with me, for me. I'll carry him, Leslie. With that raincoat, he'll slip right out of the bottom. She was impatient to be, go to be gone, so Jess 
uh, scooped up the sodden dog and shoved him rear first into the cave of Leslie's raincoat. You gotta hold his rear with your left arm and swing with your right, you know. I know, I know. She moved backwards to get a running start. Hold tight, Josh. Good, good, Josh, Jess. Good gosh, Jess. He shut his mouth. He wanted to shut his eyes, too, but he forced himself to watch her run back and race for the bank. Leap, swing, and jump off, landing gracefully on her feet on the far side. Catch! He stuck out his hand, but he was watching Leslie and P.T. and not concentrating on the rope, which slipped off the ends of his fingertips and swung in a large arc out of his reach. He jumped and grabbed it, and shouted, shutting his mind to the sound and the light of the water, he ran back and then speeded forwards. The cold stream lapped his bare heels momentarily, but then he was in the air above it and was falling awkwardly and landing on top of Pete on, on his bottom. Sorry. P.T. was on him immediately, muddy paws all over his beige green coat and his pink tongue. Tongue sandpapering Jesse's wet face. Leslie's eyes were sparkling. Arise, she barely swallowed a giggle. Arise, King of Terabithia, and let us proceed into our kingdom. The King of Terabithia snuffled and wiped his face on the back of his hand. I will arise, he replied with dignity, when thou removes this fool dog off my gut. They went to Terabithia on Tuesday and again on Wednesday. The rain continued sporadically so that by Wednesday, the creek had swollen to the trunk of the crab apple, and they were running through ankle-deep water to make their flight to Terabithia. And on the opposite bank, Jess was more careful to land on his feet. Sitting in the cold, wet britches for an hour or was no fun, even in a magic kingdom. For Jess, the fear of crossing rose with the height of the creek. Leslie never seemed to hesitate, so Jess could not hang back. But even though he could force his body to follow after, his mind hung back, wanting to cling to the crabapple tree the way Joyce Ann might cling to Mama's leg or skirt. While they were sitting in the castle on Wednesday, it began suddenly to rain so hard that the water came through the top of the shack in an icy stream. Jess tried to huddle away from the worst of them, but there was no escaping the miserable invaders. Dost know what is on my mind, O king? Leslie dumped the contents of one coffee can on the ground and put the can under the worst leak. What? You think some evil being has put a curse on our beloved kingdom? Damn weather bureau. In the dim light, he could see Leslie's face freeze into its most queenly pose, the kind of expression she usually reserved for vanquished enemies. She didn't want to kid. Her instant, he instantly repeat, repented his unkingly manner. Leslie chose to ignore it. Let us go, even up into the sacred grove and inspire of the spirits what this evil might be and how we must combat it. For a for of a truth, I perceive that there is no ordinary rain that is falling upon our kingdom. Right, Queen, Jess mumbled and crawled out of the low entrance of the castle of the castle stronghold. Under the pines, even the rain lost its driving powers. Without the filtered light of the sun, it was almost dark, and the sound of the rain hitting the pine branches up high above their heads filled the grove with a weird, tuneless music. Dread lay on Jess's stomach like a hunk of cold, undigested donut. Leslie lifted her arms and faced upwards the dark green canopy. O oh, spirits of the grove, she began solemnly, we are, we are come on behalf of our beloved kingdom, which lies even now under the spell of some evil unknown force. Give us, we beseech thee, wisdom to discern this evil and power to overcome it. She nudged Jeff with Jess with her elbow. He raised his arm. Um, uh, he felt the point of her sharp elbow again. Um, yes, please, listen, thou spirits. She seemed satisfied. At least she didn't poke him again. She just stood there quietly as if she was listening respectfully to someone talking to her. Jess was shivering whether from the cold or the place he didn't know. But he was glad when she turned to leave the grove. All he could think of was dry cold clothes, a cup of hot coffee, and maybe just plunking down in front of the TV for a couple of hours. He was obviously not worthy to be king of Terabithia. Whoever heard of a king who was scared of tall trees and a little bit of water? He swung across the creek, almost too disgusted of himself to be afraid. Halfway across, he looked down and saw the, his tongue out at the roaring below. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Tra la la la, he said to himself, then quickly looked up again towards the crabapple tree. Plodding up the hill through the mud and beating down grasses, he slammed his bare feet down hard. Left, left, he addressed him inside his head. Left my wife and forty nine children without any gingerbread. Think I might think I did right, right, right by my why don't we change why don't we change our clothes and watch TV or something over at your house? He felt like hugging her. I'll make some coffee, he said joyfully. Yuck, she said, smiling. 
and began to run for the old Perkins place, that beautiful, graceful run of hers that neither mud nor water could defeat. It seemed to, seemed to Jess when he went off to bed Wednesday night that he could relax, that everything was going to be all right, but he woke in the middle of the night with this terrible realization that it was still raining. He would just have to tell Leslie that he wouldn't go to Terabithia. After all, she had told him what, that when she was working on the house with Bill, and he didn't question her, it wasn't so much that he minded telling Leslie that he was afraid to go, it was that he minded being afraid. It was as though he had been made with a great piece missing. One of Maybell's puzzles with a huge gap where somebody eye, cheek, and jaw should have been. Lord, it would be better to be born without an arm than go through life with, a, with no guts. He hardly slept the rest of the night, listening to the horrid rain and knowing that no matter how high the creek came, Leslie would still want to cross it. That's yeah, right. So they, that one's called Evil Spear, or Evil Curse. Evil Spell. There we go. Um, so how's the weather where they live somewhere outside of Washington? Rainy. It's been raining a long time. It's kind of like it does in spring. We get a lot of rain here in spring. But a lot of rain means what for a body of water, especially a creek? It's flooding. It's rising more and more every day. That's not a good thing, especially if your only means to get to your secret land is swing on a rope over that flooding creek. <clears throat> Just went to bed, woke up in the middle of the night, what did he realize? Still raining, which means the creek will be even higher. And he's just gonna tell Leslie that he's not gonna go to Terabithia. <clears throat> he feels bad because he doesn't wanna be afraid, but he is. And he just knows that she's going to go on his own, on her own, without him. So, oh, let's continue. Chapter 10. The perfect day. He heard his dad start to pick up. Even though there was no job to go to, he left every morning early to look. Sometimes he just hung around all day at the unemployment office. On lucky days, he got picked up to unload furniture or do cleaning. Jess was awake. He might as well get up. He could milk and feed Miss Bessie and get that over with. He pulled on a t-shirt and overalls over the underwear he slept in. Where are you going? Go back to sleep, Maybell. I can't. The rain makes too much noise. Well, get up then. Why are you so mean to me? Will you shut up, Maybell? You have, you have everyone in the whole house woke up with that big mouth of yours. So Joyce Ann would have screamed, but Maybell made a face. Oh, come on, he said. I'm just going to milk Miss Bessie. Then maybe we can watch cartoons if we keep the sound real low. Maybelle was as scrawny as Brenda was fat. She stood a moment in the middle of the floor in her underwear, her skin white and boot goose bumpy. Her eyes were still drooped from sleep and her pale brown hair stuck all over her head like a squirrel's nest on a winter's branch. That's got to be the world's ugliest kid, he thought, looking at her over with genuine affection. He threw her jeans into her face. I'm going to tell Mama. He threw the jeans back at her. Tell Mama what? How you just stand there staring at me when I ain't got no clothes on? Lord, she thought he was enjoying it. Yeah, well, he said, heading for the door. She wouldn't throw anything else at him. Pretty girl like you can't hardly help myself. He could hear her giggling as he crossed the kitchen. The shed was filled with Miss Bessie's familiar smell. He clucked her gently on over the over and set his tool at her flank. In the pail beneath her speckled udder, the rain pounded the metal roof of the shed so that the plank of milk in the milk pail set up a counter rhythm. If only it would stop raining. He pressed his forehead against Miss Bessie's warm hide. He wondered idly if cows were ever scared. Really scared. He had seen Miss Bessie jitter away from P.T., but that was different. A yapping puppy at your heels is an immediate threat, but the difference between him and Miss Bessie was that when there was no P.T. in sight, she was perfectly content, sleepily chewing her cud. She wasn't staring down at the old Perkins place, wondering and worrying. She wasn't standing there on the tippy toes while anxiety ate holes through her, all her stomachs. He stroked her forehead and crossed her flank and sighed. If there was still water in the creek come summer, he'd ask Leslie to teach him how to swim. How's that, he said to himself. 
I'll just grab the old terror by the shoulders and shake the daylights out of it. Maybe I'll even learn scuba diving. He shuddered. He may not have been born with guts, but he didn't have to ha he didn't have to die without them. Hey, maybe you could go down to me the medical college and get the get a gut transplant. No, doc, I got need a perfectly good heart. What I need is a gut transplant. How about it? He smiled. He'd have to tell Leslie about wanting a gut transplant. It was the kind of nonsense she had appreciated. Of course, he broke the rhythm of the milking long enough to shove his hair out of his face. Of course, what I really need is a brain transplant. I know, Leslie. I know she's going to bite my head off or make fun of me if I say I don't want to go across the to go across again till the creek's down. All I got to do is say, Leslie, I don't want to go over there today. Just like that. Easy as pie. Leslie, I don't want to go over there today. How come? How come? Because, because, well, because I called you three times already, Maybell was intimidating Ellie's prissiest manner. Call me for what? Some lady wants you on the telephone. I had to get dressed to come and get you. He never got phone calls. Leslie had called him exactly once, and Brenda had gone into a, such a song and dance with her about Jesse's getting a call from his sweetheart that Leslie had decided to simply just come to the house and get him when she wanted to talk. Sounds kind of like Miss Edmonds. It was Miss Edmonds. Jess, her voice flowed through the receiver. Miserable weather, isn't it? Yes, am he was scared to say more for fear she'd hear the shake. I was thinking of driving down to Washington. Maybe go to the Smithsonian or the National Gallery? How would you like to keep me company? He broke out in a cold sweat. Jess? He licked his lips and shoved his hair off his face. You still there, Jess? Yes, am He tried to get a deep breath so he could keep talking. Would you like to go with me? Lord. Yes, am do you need to get permission, she asked gently. Yeah, yes, yes, um. He had somehow managed to twist himself up in the phone cord. Yes, um, just, just a minute. He untangled himself, put the phone down quietly, and tiptoed to, to his parents' room. His mother's back made a long hump under the cotton blanket. She shook her shoulder very gently. Mama, he was almost whispering. He wanted to ask her without her really waking up, so she was likely to say no if she woke up and thought about it. She jumped at the sound and but relaxed again, not fully awake. Teacher wants me to go to Washington to the Smithsonian. Washington? The syllables were blurred. Yeah, something for school. He stroked her upper arm. Be back before too late, okay? Um, don't worry, I'm done milking. Um, she pulled the blanket to her ears and turned on her stomach. Jess crept back to the phone. It's okay, Miss Edmonds, I can go. Great, I'll pick you up in 20 minutes. Just tell me how to get to your house. Soon as he saw her car turn in, Jess raced out the kitchen door, through the rain, and met her halfway up the drive. His mother could find out the details from Maybell after he was safely up the road. He was glad Maybell was absorbed in the TV. He didn't want her waking Mama up before he got away. He was scared to look back even after he was in the car on the main and on the main road for fear he'd see his mother screaming after him. It didn't occur him it occurred to him until the car was past Millsburg that he might have asked Miss Edmonds if Leslie could have come. When he thought about it, he couldn't suppress a secret pleasure of being alone in a small, cozy car with Miss Edmonds. She drove intently, both hands gripping the top of the wheel, peering forward. The wheels hummed, and the windshield wipers slicked a merry rhythm. The car was warm and filled with the smell of Miss Edmonds. Jess sat with his hands clasped between his knees, the seat belt tied across his chest. Damn, Rain, she said. I was going stir-crazy. Yes, he said happily. You too, huh? She gave him a quick smile. He felt dizzy from the closeness. He nodded. Have you ever been to the National Gallery? No, ma'am. He had never even been in Washington before, but he hoped she wouldn't ask him that. She smiled at him again. Is this your first trip to an art gallery? Yes, am Great, she said. My life would have been worthwhile after all. He didn't understand her, but he didn't care. He knew she was happy to be with him and that he was enough to know. Even in the rain, he could make out the landmarks, look, looking surprisingly the way he, the books had pictured them the Lee Mansion high on the hill, the bridge, and twice around the circle, so he could get a good look at Abraham Lincoln looking out across the city, the White House and the monument, and the other end at the, the other end capital. Leslie had seen all the places a million times. She had even gotten to school with a girl whose father was a congressman. He thought he might tell Miss Edmonds later that Leslie was a personal friend of a real, of a real congressman. Miss Edmonds had always liked Leslie. 
Entering the gallery, it was like stepping inside the pine grove, the huge vaulted marble, the cold splash of the fountain, and the green growing all around. Two little children had pulled away from their mothers and were running around screaming to each other. It was all Jess could do not to grab them and tell them how to behave in so obviously a sacred place. And then the pictures, room after room, floor after floor. He was drunk with color and form and hugeness, and with the voice and perfume of Miss Edmonds always beside him. She would bend her head down close to his face to give him some explanation or ask him a question, her black hair falling across her shoulders. Men would stare at her instead of the pictures, and Jess felt like they must be jealous of him for being with her. They ate a late lunch in the cafeteria. When she mentioned lunch, he realized of horror that he would need money, and he didn't know how to tell her that he hadn't brought any. Didn't have any to bring, for that matter. But before he had time to figure out something, anything, she said, now I'm going to have to, I'm not going to have any argument about who's paying. I'm a liberated woman, Jess Aarons. When I invite a man out, I pay. He tried to think of some way to protest without ending up with a bill, but couldn't and found himself getting a $3 meal, which was far more than he had meant to have spent, have her spend on him. Tomorrow he would check out with Leslie how he should have handled things. After lunch, they trotted through the drizzle to the Smithsonian to see the dinosaurs and the Indians. There they came upon a display case holding miniature scenes of Indians disguised in buffalo skins, scaring a herd of buffalo into stampeding over a cliff to their death, with more Indians waiting below to butcher and skin them. It was a three-dimensional nightmare version of some of his own drawings. He felt a frightening sense of kinship with it. Fascinating, isn't it? Miss Edmund said, her hair brushing her cheek as she leaned over to look at him. Look at it. He touched his cheek. Yes, um. To himself, he said, I don't think I like it. But he could hardly pull himself away. When they came out of the building, it was into brilliant spring sunshine. Jess blinked his eyes. Again, the glare and the glisten. Wow, Miss Edmund said, a miracle. Behold the sun. I was beginning to think that she had gone into the cave and vowed never to return. Like the Japanese myth. He felt good again. All the way home in the sunshine, Miss Edmund told funny stories about going to college one year in Japan, where all the boys had been shorter than she, and she hadn't known how to use the toilets. He relaxed. He had so much to tell Leslie and ask her. It didn't matter how angry his mother was. She'd get over it, and it was worth it. This one perfect day of his life was worth anything he had to pay. One dip in the road before the old Perkins place, he said. Let me out at the road, Miss Edmonds. Don't try to turn. You might get stuck in the mud. Okay, Jess, she said. She pulled over the road. Thank you for a beautiful day. The western sun danced on the windshield, dazzling his eyes. He turned and looked Miss Edmonds full in the face. No, ma'am. His voice sounded squeaky and strange. He cleared his throat. No, ma'am, thank you. Well, he hated to leave without being able to say, to really say thank you, to really thank her, but the words were not coming out for him. Later, of course, they would when he was lying in bed or sitting in the castle. Well, he opened the door and got out. See you next Friday. She nodded, smiling. See you. He watched the car go out of sight and then turned and ran with all his might to the house. The joy and giggling and jiggling inside of him so hard he wouldn't even been surprised if his feet had just taken off from the ground the way they sometimes did in a dream or floated him right over the roof. He was all the way to the kitchen before he realized that something was wrong. His dad's pickup had been outside the door, but he hadn't taken it in until he came into the room and found them all sitting there, his parents, the little girls at the kitchen table, Ellie and Brenda on the couch, not eating. There was no food on the table, not watching TV. It wasn't even turned on. He stood unmoving for a second while they stared at him. Suddenly, his mother let out a great shuddering sob. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, she said. It over and over, her head down on her arms. His father moved to put his arm around her awkwardly, but he didn't take his eyes off Jess. I told you he'd just gone off somewhere, Maybelle said quietly, stubbornly, and as though she had repeated it often and no one had believed her. He squinted his eyes as though trying to peer down a dark drain pipe. He didn't even know what question to ask them. What well, he tried to begin... Brenda, pouty, pouting voice, broke in. Your girlfriend's dead, and Mama thought you were dead, too. All right, that's where we're going to stop today. So, 
chapter called The Perfect Day. What was the perfect day? His teacher that he's just in, completely in love with came and picked him up and took him to Washington, D.C., to the Smithsonian Museum to see art and other natural history things. And it was a perfect day, but it was raining. But did the perfect day last? No. no. What did the sister say at the end? I'm doing well. When he asked what was going on, with his whole family sitting at the table, Brenda, his sister, said, your girlfriend's dead, <clears throat> and Mama thought you was dead, too. So, uh, not a great part to leave on, but that's where we're stopping. We will continue after, or on the next video. Actually, we'll finish on the next video. So, we will see you guys then.